Hi, everyone. This is Diane Stairfenner. We are going to go ahead and get started. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Again, I'm Diane Stairfenner. I'm president of SupportEd, and I'll be moderating today's webinar that we're hosting for you. SupportEd is a woman-owned small business located in the Washington, D.C. area, and we're devoted to supporting English learners, their teachers, and their families. We provide online and face-to-face -face professional development and technical assistance to districts, states, organizations, and also the U.S. Department of Education. Our presenter today is Dr. Eugenia or Jeannie Krimmel. Um, and if you are tweeting about this event today, you can use the hashtag ELs online to connect in this uh, way. And also our Twitter handle is at support educ. You can see our website, getsupported.net and our Facebook page. So there are lots of different ways to connect. So let's go ahead and get started. So we're gonna start by opening up a poll. And our first poll is to just get a sense of where you are from uh, to see where you're located. So just click, you can click once if you're in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, or maybe someplace else, Antarctica perhaps. Um, go ahead and and vote. We'll give you a couple of minutes because we have so many people on today. We have close to 800 people live, um, which is incredible for this event. And we want to get a sense of where you are coming from. It, there's definitely a lag time in terms of where you're voting from and what I'm seeing on my screen. But uh, please go ahead and vote. Right now I'm seeing the majority from North America with some from Africa and Asia. And again, we only have about 5% of people at showing who have voted. So uh, please go ahead and cast your vote if you can. And uh, also, you know, we're sharing a little, I see some questions coming in in the Q&A box. We'll show you how to do that in just a bit. Um, if you have technical questions, please use the chat and my colleagues who are joining us today from behind the scenes will be answering those questions. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll because we have a lot of content to talk about. And I'll share those results with you once Zoom catches up here. So hopefully you can see these results um, that most of you are coming in from North America, with also a little from Europe, Africa, and Asia. So thanks for joining us from wherever you are. So in moving along here, so again, I'm Diane Sterfenner, and I'm going to be hosting our webinar today. Um, and like I shared earlier, I'm the president of Support Ed, and you can connect with me on Twitter at dsterfenner. So when I started hearing about school closures related to coronavirus, and I also experienced my own children's school closures, I don't know about you, but I started feeling really anxious about everything. Um, so, and I imagine a lot of you are feeling the same way. My team and I, we got together and we wanted to do something to help our community of educators of English learners or ELLs navigate this uncharted territory since there's just so much uncertainty out there and things are changing by the hour. So we reached out to Jeannie Krimmel, Eugenia or Jeannie Krimmel, and she's an expert in EL online learning and she'll present our content today. And my team, like I mentioned, is working behind the scenes to compile a lot of resources and also spread the word about today's event. And we also thank you who have, we know have spread the word about our webinar today. So um, right before we started, we had around 1,800 people who have registered for this webinar. And uh, let's see, live, we are close to 900 people. And that shows you this topic is really weighing heavily on people's hearts and minds. So thank you so much for joining us today. And just wanted to reiterate and remind everyone that we're, we're all in this together. And I really appreciate having you all as my community. So just uh, some bits of technical information about before we get started, some tips for using Zoom. Um, just taking a look at our online platform, if you're not familiar with it. 
So just take a, a minute here to find your control bar, which is visible if you've downloaded Zoom. We'll be pausing for questions at the end of the presentation, and you'll use the Q&A button to ask any content-related questions to Jeannie. You can enter these questions whenever you have one, and they'll be saved until the end of the presentation. Um, and then if you happen to experience any technical difficulties, use the chat button to let us know. You can also use the chat button to get, connect with each other and to comment on the webinar. Thanks so much. So our agenda for today is, I, we're doing the welcome right now, and then Jeannie will share two key considerations of cyber or virtual English learner education, then five technology suggestions, and next, strategies for K-12 online instruction for ELLs, and then she'll follow up with some web resources geared towards English learner teaching and learning. At the end, we'll have a live Q&A, and then we'll wrap up. And this webinar is being recorded. So after the webinar is over, we'll send you a link to the recording within about 48 hours of our end time today. We'll also share a link to a downloadable certificate that you'll get for one hour of professional development. We'll share that link with you in the chat and in the PowerPoint itself at the end of the webinar. So stay tuned until the end so you can get the link and you can access your certificate online. So even though you're home, you can still continue your professional learning and submit this uh, certificate to your district or organization so hopefully you can get a credit of one hour i mean for today's time your time with us we've also created a padlet for today's webinar and that url that you'll type in if you'd like to access the padlet of resources is bit.ly forward slash e l s o n l i n e or l's online and that is case sensitive. So this Padlet contains all the resources that uh, Jeannie is mentioning in the presentation, as well as additional resources for online instruction, and it's really comprehensive. Throughout the presentation, you'll see an icon of, a, of an origami crane, and you can see that now in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And that icon indicates that resources mentioned can be found on the Padlet. We'll also share this link to the Padlet in today's chat, and the Padlet will remain open indefinitely after the webinar. To access all of the resources the Padlet has, please scroll vertically in each column and left or right to view all of the columns. And also note that the Padlet might be slow to load right now because all of the people suddenly using Padlet who may not normally use it. So please bear with us. And if you don't see things load, you can keep refreshing your page. Now I'd like to share a little bit about our wonderful presenter today. I've had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Eugenia or Jeannie Krimmel for quite a number of years now. She's an EL expert who specializes in online learning. Dr. Krimmel currently wears two hats. One is an ESL instructional coach for Commonwealth Charter Academy, a K-12 cyber school located in Pennsylvania. She's also the founder of collegeesl.com, which provides online tutoring and mentoring to EL college students. And we'll give you her contact information at the end of the presentation today. So our objectives today is that you'll learn two key considerations of cyber or virtual L education, five technology suggestions, strategies for K-12 online instruction of Ls, and also web resources geared toward L teaching and learning. And we're gonna do one more poll before Jeannie gets started. So I will launch that poll for you, the next one, and be thinking about these questions. So what's the most significant challenge you, you have currently or you anticipate having with teaching English learners online? Is it internet access for your students, device or computer access for your students, content resources and scaffolding, keeping in contact with students and families, 
or home language resources or other. Maybe you're thinking all of the above um, because this is all so new to so many of the, us and it's happening so suddenly in the context of fear in general and uncertainty and misinformation around what's happening around the world. So I think a lot of you have voted, more than half of you have voted here. So I'm going to uh, end our polling now and share the results with you. So you can see hopefully on your screens that most people share that content resources and scaffolding are going to be the most significant challenge to them. Also with the next uh, category being device or com computer access for students. And Jeannie is going to be talking about all of these areas in her presentation. So next, Jeannie will share two key considerations of cyber or virtual L education. So I will let her get started. Okay, thank you so much, Diane, and good, um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I, I do wanna thank Diane for giving me the honor of speaking to all of you today and um, working through some of these uh, issues. This may be new territory for some of you, um, as she mentioned. Um, but first of all, I would like to offer my, my thoughts and my prayers um, to go out to those who are impacted by the coronavirus in your families, your communities, and your countries. Uh, together, we will overcome these challenges that we now face. So let's take a look at some of the considerations for educating ELLs online. And the first is the um, copyright laws. So you want to look to your school policies to um, make sure that you know the copyright laws, any electronic communications and equitable practices for any suggestions that are presented in this webinar. Schools may have purchased licenses for paid subscription use, but if not, you may be violating a copyright law if you use uh, some visuals or you um, link to some, some videos or what have you. So you wanna make sure that you check with your school as to what subscriptions you may have ahead of time and know what it is that you can uh, present to the students electronically. And as for electronic communications, you will wanna ask your school what web-based applications or programs you are allowed to use through their platform. So you just wanna check on that. And we'll be talking about some of those um, as we move along here. And check also with the school practices for, for equitability. Uh, for example, if you have uh, an attendance policy for students who can get online and then students who cannot get online. So those who are online or offline, uh, maybe using paper packets, which we'll talk about in a little while. So, um, so make sure that you have communicated with your school. And um, if you don't have those answers, then you may want to ask your school. Maybe this is such new territory that um, you haven't breached that as a community or a school at this point. So um, consideration number two is uh, trusted translation and interpretation. And I, I use the word trusted there because, you know, it is, is difficult sometimes to know, unless you have school personnel who you know and have worked with your, you know, school community or you have a community member who um, you have trusted with the communication and interpretation already, um, and you can, you know, certainly tap into their expertise. Um, but you also have some extensions and some apps that you could use. And so you want to send ELLs and their families uh, written or video how-to guides for such extensions or apps like True, uh, Google Translate or Microsoft Translator. Keep in mind that they are not perfect <laughs> translations. So you may wanna put a disclaimer um, out you know, onto your website or uh, wherever you're communicating with your families that they are, um, that you are communicating with machine translation, uh, just so that they know that it's not something that you intended, um, you know, if there's a, a blooper of some sort or miscommunication. And then also you can translate with Microsoft's 
immersive reader. I don't know if many of you are familiar with this, but it is an extension that you have to download. But the, the beauty of this, if you will, is um, immersive reader will, the, the Microsoft immersive reader will read text and um, on, on the screen and it will read it slowly for you. You can change the speed. Um, you can break it into syllables. You know, you can, can use it in that way for any student who needs text read to them. But it also has a translation feature. And so the um, translation, will, I, I believe, is in about 60 languages, if I'm not mistaken. And so it will translate the text into that language, and then it will read it to them. So this is a really great tool for ELLs especially those who uh, may have a text in front of them that is beyond their, their reading ability at this point, uh, maybe make a first grader, second grader um, who, who doesn't read as much as the, the text is in front of them, um, or they haven't learned to read in their, their native language, but they can listen and they can hear it. And it's also great for L parents as well. So it's a tool that I think you're going to use once you have um, established that, you'll use it for a lot of different things. For translations, uh, there is an app called Talking Points, and it seamlessly translates messages back and forth in the preferred languages of the sender and receiver. Uh, for example, if you want to send um, a text to a family, or the families you know, on your caseload, you do have to set this up ahead of time, but it, as far as I know, it's a free service. Uh, last I looked anyway, it was a free service. And um, you would go on, put the, the phone number of the parent or the student, and then you choose the language to which they will receive. So let's say, for example, you have a Swahili speaking family. You say, you know, school is still closed next week. They receive it in Swahili. They say, thank you very much in Swahili, and it comes back to you in English. So, um, so that is a, a wonderful resource. Your school may also have a phone-based contract with a, uh, an on-demand inter interpretation service that may also serve you well in phone conversations with parents and students. Such, such services have to be pre-arranged by the schools with companies like TransPerfect. These service providers are paid sites, however, and have not endorsed this webinar in any way. Please note that any electronic transmission on school platforms can be subject to right to know laws in your state. So therefore, I stress again that you check with your school and your school district's policy before use. Okay, the third, and oh, the Padlet has a lot of um, translation resources for you there, um, which the team at Support Ed has put together for you. So I, I highly encourage you to go there and check it out when we're done here. So thank you. So now I'm going to um, talk to you about some uh, technology suggestions, because before you start teaching online, you must make sure that technology is in place and working. So let's explore this aspect of cyber education. And, and like Diane, my first thought when I heard that schools were closing and so forth was um, the idea of the disruption that is, is happening in schools. And I also thought about how the school switch to online uh, in such a short amount of time would impact students who don't have access uh, to the internet or they don't have an electronic device for learning online. So two ideas came to mind, or workarounds. Um, one is the phone capacities. So uh, if you could email and text students and or families if they have phones. Uh, because many of our L's and their families do not read English, translated messages through various browser translation extensions, such as the talking points, would be very helpful um, for, for that purpose. Uh, but you can use phones. I mean, our phones are just so robust now that um, there are a lot of capabilities that they could um, use, but you can communicate uh, through email and text. And then um, some of the Internet providers such as Comcast and Spectrum are now offering temporarily some free internet service that wasn't previously in your community or in your neighborhood. So please check that out and uh, see if the, um, you know, make sure that the L parents know of that as well. 
and that's important um, for their access because normally we would send them maybe to a public library or a community uh, center to say okay you can use the um, the free internet there or maybe have them come to your school um, parking lot and use that but that's not safe right now so it's not advisable at this point so and then lastly good old-fashioned paper so paper handouts created and or compiled by the teacher is better than no instruction at all so have them available to students without phones or other devices who come to grab and go meals at the local school during the closure um, I did see on the news that there are some school districts that are actually taking meals to families. So hopefully you can get your, your um, handouts and packets to the people who are distributing the, the meals to the children. And then the next suggestion is tech buddies. And why would they need tech buddies? Well, even if students have used some applications, computer applications at, in um, your school, um, they may not have that at home. So they may not have used the system that you're using right now, like maybe a Google Hangout or um, a Nearpod, which we'll talk about in a little while. So these may be new systems to them. And the L families may also have limited to no technology experience. So they may not be able to help their students as well. Um, therefore, a, an idea is to assign L's an online tech buddy to show them how to turn on the translation extension, for example, or how to use um, other various parts of the online instruction that you are presenting to the students. This tech, this virtual tech buddy can be a same language student or can be a tech savvy classmate. So uh, wanna think about who might be a, a good student to pair with the others, um, with the, the L. And then providing um, keyboard practice links. This is something uh, in the virtual world that we have noticed with English learners and I wasn't sure if you were aware, but um, did you know that uh, keyboards vary from language to language? Um, not only can you switch the settings within your laptop or device to a different language, keyboards can also themselves be sold as language specific um, in their arrangement of character keys and letters. So your L may be using a device at home with a non-English keyboard and this may cause the L to hesitate to chat online, for example, because they might type too slowly. So if you feel that your L's need practice to become more fluent with English keyboard writer, you can send links to typing games such as typing games dot zone and um, and they can practice that. Suggestion four is for clear and frequent communication. So send L's notices and reminders through email, text, and if allowed, social media. Announce virtual classroom times, assignment reminders, and links to important information, such as how to contact your tech, your technology, or IT support. This is important because you're going to be very busy as educators and teachers setting up the, the lessons and, and um, doing the things, you know, behind the scenes and then also engaging with the students and, and grading and so forth. And the tech folks um, will most likely, you know, be able to handle some of the questions uh, coming through um, with some of your students as far as the, the actual nuts and bolts of the technology. Um, I do want to also mention to you that you want to check and make sure that your school's IT and um, tech support have access to the interpretation services that you use through the school, um, such as TransPerfect. And the last suggestion I have for you here in this segment is to um, the different platforms to facilitate on online learning. So for synchronous instruction, which we will talk a little bit more about in a moment, the live streaming platforms allow ELLs to develop oral skills while engaging in social and academic discourse. These are some of the options that you see here, Google Hangouts, Google Classroom, Canvas, which integrates Zoom, which is what we're using right now, or Zoom by itself, and there are many, many others. So again, check with your school. Many of these companies are offering free features or subscriptions during this outbreak. 
Zoom has an exceptional feature for ELLs. The recording of a session, not during the session, but the recording of that session can be translated by choosing the preferred language. When you go back in and um, look at the, the recording, you can go up and choose a, a language and then the transcript will appear and be read to the student in the, their preferred language while the teacher simultaneously speaks in English. This is a great tool for ELLs to learn both content and language at the same time. So keep that in mind and explore that feature of Zoom. And here are some instructional strategies in the cyber environment to consider. We have two types of cyber environments for ELLs and I have sort of at a glance chart here for you. And the first, as I mentioned um, just a few minute, moments ago is the, the synchronous. And this is real time virtual interaction. The advantages for ELLs in a synchronous environment is that focus on oral language skills developed through social cues and modeling. The interaction with the peers and the teachers is very important. You also have the negotiating, negotiated meaning opportunities, which second language acquisition research tells us is very important. And it allows more student to student interaction than only student to teacher. There are some disadvantages more or less to the, the L's and one is the pace of conversation and an, an instruction that may be a little too fast for them and you know they need that processing time so sometimes that may be a little bit difficult for them and scheduling virtual classes may conflict with either another class or something like that so that can be a little bit tricky. Asynchronous on the other hand is not in real time virtual interaction it focuses more on literacy development. But the advantage here also is that it gives time to process content and respond. The L's also have time to translate words and phrases and they can repeat videos and they can repeat listening to audio uh, as often as they need to or want to, which is a, a great advantage for the, the English learners. And it also allows more of that student to teacher intervention for either clarification or meeting an L's needs that only the ESL specialist can provide. The disadvantage here is that loss of social cues and ne negotiated meaning opportunities that help develop a second language or an additional language. So in a nutshell, asynchronous lacks the variations in human interaction that allow for language acquisition through negotiated meaning and social cues, while synchronous lacks the time for L's to process receptive input and the rehearsal time needed to produce English as a second or a new language. So my recommendation is to have a balance of the two types. So let's take a look at that balance. Because L's need to develop all four language skills, L online instruction must involve the effective mix of swirl. I love that swirl, it's so cool. Speaking, writing, reading, and listening. So think squirrel, swirl, not squirrel, but swirl when you're um, thinking about planning for English learners instruction. And the balance of how much each type, whether synchronous or asynchronous, rests in our understanding of second language acquisition research. Beginners, beginner L's need more comprehensible input through physical modeling and visuals, total physical response or TPR activities in live synchronous lessons, as well as through asynchronous tasks provide this learning opportunity. While more advanced students can comprehend written content better, they are still in need of oral language practice. So plan your program and or your lessons according to the proficiency levels of students. And I created this chart uh, because we are, we're grappling this with in our, in our own school. Um, currently right now our school is more on that synchronous side and um, 
we uh, are taking a look at by adding some of the, the synchronous or, or more of that balance. Um, are we engaging the students more and is there more student achievement and so far we have seen a positive trend in both of those areas. So I created that chart just about a month ago to um, to communicate that to within our school actually um, to, to show that need for that balance. So uh, the next consideration um, or instructional recommendation I have for you of course is model, model, model. Establish a model virtual classroom rules and expectations. If your instruction or your assessments involve an asynchronous discussion task, for example, be sure to post a model of acceptable and unacceptable responses. Uh, for example, you may, you know, ask them for, um, you know, something according to a prompt and unacceptable would be, you know, just your, I agree with you, um, I don't know, you know, those kind of things. You, you want to make sure that you, um, also model something that is acceptable to the task and you want to make sure you match that to the objective of the prompt. Teachers also have to model class dialogue through sentence starters and frames like talk moves shown on a uh, screen share or a whiteboard in that virtual classroom. And Flipgrid is an asynchronous platform that will benefit ELLs because they can both listen to classmates and teachers' oral responses, as well as record their own English spoken re responses when they're ready, so they can practice and, um, and then eventually record that in their own time. So, and I believe now Diane has another poll for you. Well, yes, I do. Um, mm -hmm. Swirl, not squirrel. That's my big, uh, <laughs> that's my big <laughs> takeaway so far. No, I'm kidding. This, thanks so much for all of your information that you've been sharing, Jeannie. This is so wonderful. Um, I'm going to start the third poll now about um, what you see as your needs being right now as an educator. So think of we have four needs and five being other. What's your top need right now in terms of teaching English learners online? Is it professional development on online teaching? Access to content resources for English learners? Access to online platforms or tools for communicating with families? So think about your own needs right now and what are your, what's your top need right now? And uh, I think Zoom is honestly being very slow. I've only seen one person of 1009 that we have with you live as voting which I think is really hard to believe. Um, so maybe we can, since our poll, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, you can feel free to respond in the chat if you would like. What are, what are your top needs? And I see a few more, a couple of more trickling in, but um, I, suspect, uh, I suspect there are more of you trying to answer this on Zoom right now. It's only showing that five of you have voted which, uh, you know, let, we can blow up our chat a little bit and you can share what needs you have right now, your top need. So go ahead and share that in the chat and I'm gonna end this poll. So I'm sharing the results and it looks like from what we're getting, you know, access to content resources, to online platforms and tools for communicating with families would be the top needs. And we'll continue on with Jeannie here in terms of uh, she's going to share some web resources. Okay, very good. Thank you. There are numerous web resources that enhance language and content learning for ELLs, and they're available to educators, and many more are being created every day. So these are just a few I recommend to you because I have used them or I have observed teachers using them effectively. In order to be able to um, look at your lesson creation and organization and collaboration platforms and pre prepare for the switch to um, distance learning or, or cyber or virtual learning, um, these platforms will provide teachers the ability to create uh, visibly engaging content and practice and um, assessments through a multitude of these free and paid subscription platforms. 
such as Nearpod. For example, Nearpod, you can make a lesson with all kinds of mixed media in that. Um, so you can put, you know, your your starter prompt or some a, a small text or, or something like that in the in your first slide, the next slide. You can send them out on a virtual tour. They can go and look at uh, Peru right now and uh, Machu Picchu, and then you can have them come back and answer questions. They can incorporate um, some collaboration through Padlet, and uh, there's just a multitude of things that you can put together with a Nearpod lesson and uh, engage the students in that platform. And um, so, so that's a, a really great one to explore. Wakelet is another, it's a means to curate and to organize instructional information. Uh, again, multimedia kind of things that you can put um, you know, your own infographics or you find an infographics, you can put that on and then with a video and um, you can do collaboration within the Wakelet. And then of course you also see the Padlet, which um, the support ed team has put together for you. And that is an excellent online collaboration tool. But as I say, there are many, many more. Content and language lesson resources for ELLs. Uh, one of my go-tos has always been the Voice of America has um, learning English. They have English in a minute. They have idioms for English and they have three levels. Um, it's current events. So, um, you know, it reads it to you and it shows you the text, but it's also very current. And, uh, and then it's broken down by subject matter. So you have science and social studies and math. And um, it's just a really great, go-to tool. Uh, I really love that. Um, L Civics is, of course, a, a social studies, but you can use it for English language arts as well to look at some of the, um, the written documentation, uh, but that was created specifically for English learners to understand uh, U.S. government and civics. Ben's Guide is similar. Um, Ben's Guide is created more in um, grade levels. Well, I think L Civics is also by grade level, if I'm not mistaken. So an excellent guide there. Breaking English News, if you're not familiar with that, that also has news articles. It does have a reader feature to it. Um, and then you can also choose the Lexile level. So if you have level ones and level twos and level threes that you're, you're working with, you can choose those Lexile levels um, to make them more accessible to the students. And then lastly, Randall's ESL Cyber Listening Lab is uh, amazing. It's been around for a really long time um, and that is where they can get a lot of oral language practice, but it, they also have um, you know, vocabulary and grammar and, and some writing exercises. So if you haven't explored these resources already for your ELLs, now is a great time to become familiar with these features and content of each one of them, which, which will be able to assist in both language and content learning. In the chat, uh, please share any of your go-to web resources that you use for ELLs, whether you use them online or offline. That would be a great way for us to share as a community. And additional resources um, for a more comprehensive list of websites beneficial to L instruction, again, both online and in traditional classroom settings offline. View the comprehensive list from Deerfield Beach School District in Florida. Uh, it is impressive. So thank you so much, Deerfield Beach School District. You did a great job of curating all of that for us. So the link is there on the Padlet and that's your go-to spot. And lastly, um, Color in Colorado, in case you aren't aware, has newsletters and fact sheets for L students and parents about the COVID-19 outbreak in English, Spanish, and Simplified Chinese. And just as a reminder to check out the palette for those valuable resource links to use on your online education setting uh, right now. You can use them uh, today if you like. And my closing thoughts um, is I, I just want to mention that, you know, with some planning and keeping the second language acquisition principles in mind, teachers and ELLs together, we can grow and learn uh, in this new frontier of education of ELLs. 
I appreciate you listening and interacting with this information today. Before we take questions, I just want to assure you that ESL cyber education meets the language development needs of English learners, both in receiving and producing language and content. Some people have expressed to me that they didn't I think that was possible, um, but I can assure you it's been going on for a really long time. I've been involved with ESL online um, education since 2005, and um, so it's, it's been evolving and it's ever-changing, um, but it is there and it is effective. So, and again, I want to wish you all well in the stressful time and um, thank Diane and, um, and all of you for facilitating this webinar so that we all can learn and grow. So at this time, I believe um, Diane will take over and do the question and answer segment. <laughs> I will I will ask the questions and you will answer them, Jeannie. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's a deal. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'll be happy to chime in as, as I can. But um, thank you to everybody who submitted questions and who've been just so actively engaged in this webinar so far. Um, so we've taken some questions previously on online from some of you had submitted some and we have oh, about 50 questions that have come in during the webinar so we obviously won't be able to get to all of them i'll pull out a few that are um, kind of more general in nature if you have specific questions we'll share Jeannie's contact info at the end of this presentation so um, here's someone who would like some ideas for working with kindergarten, first and second grade students online. So what, what should be different for those students? What do you think, Jeannie? Excellent question. Um, they do need more sort of synchronous animation. They're gonna need demonstration. Um, so, you know, I don't know that you have a dock cam, but you certainly have lots of other cameras. You can even use your phone. Um, again, check with your school policy if you're allowed to do that. Um, but demonstrating things for them and uh, reading to them and making sure that you find like an A, I saw somebody wrote A to Z reader. Um, that's, you know, a, a great website as well. Um, to be able to engage them in literature, but um, in literacy skills, but uh, they do need, uh, you know, a little bit more of those visuals um, that um, either through the webcam or uh, whatever device you can use to show them um, some things and, and to read to them and that kind of thing. Great, thanks. And here's another one. Um, someone shares that their principal says online teaching in the middle school right now is about student well-being more than content learning. What might this mean for English learners? What does online wellness look like? So online oh, wellness, yeah, if, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Would you, did you have something else? Oh, no, I was just saying that's kind of a, that's a tough one. What does online wellness look like? Right, and if I'm, reading it correctly and from what I understand it may be um, related to their their current sort of mental state um, through this uh, this outbreak so there may be um, you know having a forum where they can ask questions and um, you know interact with each other uh, to be able not so much to you know tell each other the the next fearful thing um, but maybe really to have a, a conversation and I would um, suggest that you involve your school counselors in those kind of online uh, webinar sessions if you have a, a group chat uh, because um, I think that is a little bit more about the not so much as you say the content learning but how are they handling the stress and the uncertainty that we are all going through right now and they're they're feeling it from their parents and they're feeling it from us and um, and they're you know in a lot of, of turmoil because I think they're a little bit more aware than maybe elementary so that's why I think that the middle school question may have come through um, they're a little bit more conscious of what's going on and so um, it's good to, to have a place for them to talk through. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jeannie. Um, a couple of questions have come in specifically about Microsoft Immersive Reader, mm -hmm. such as does it work on Macs? What program is needed to add this to? Um, anything else you can say on Microsoft Immersive Reader? Is it free, for example? As far as I know, it's free. Um, we use it in our cyber charter school at Commonwealth Charter Academy. Um, 
and so it's a, a you know Microsoft feature. You do have to download it, um, and then you know you can use it for um, whatever is on the screen. Other than it won't do you know videos or you know things that are um, what I want to say a screenshot or P PDFs or whatever. It has to be something that they can access um, that has been you know typed in or written in. Um, the the immersive reader. I don't know whether it works on a Mac because I've never worked on that. So um, you can go on the link that I have given Diane will send you over for more information and you'll be able to to read a lot about that. So we've been using them on PCs, but um, you know, you can check on that with a MacBook. Great. I would assume it does work on a MacBook and any, you know, use of Microsoft um, products would probably include the Microsoft immersive reader. But you might have to check that out. Great. Thank you. Um, so here's another question about, I've seen some come in about newcomers. Do you have any specific recommendations in teaching newcomers online? Yes. So um, again, that immersive reader would be helpful if they do come, you know, um, because they may not be able to read. Maybe they've had interrupted schooling. Um, so they may not read their own language, but hearing it, they, they may be able to understand it better. Um, they and their parents um, would be great um, to have that. Um, the Zoom feature also is a really uh, wonderful way to have them, you know, they've listened to it in English as the teacher is delivering a synchronous recorded session and then they can go back and um, again, if they, do read. I mean, just because they're newcomers doesn't mean they, they don't have, you know, literacy in their, their own language or some literacy in English, um, but they may be able to translate it into their own language, let's say Swahili, and, um, and they can both read it and listen to the Swahili, which is actually ac academic language, actually academic language, that was hard to say. So, um, so that's a great use for the, the newcomers, um, but also making sure that you give as many comprehensible visuals as possible. Um, I know that's a lot harder for abstract concepts like, you know, democracy and showing an American flag that doesn't really work. Um, so any means that you can to um, help with comprehensibility, um, you may have to curate those a little bit differently than for other students, but um, glossaries, for example, you can have some picture glossaries and that kind of thing as well for newcomers. Thanks. Um, there are also a few questions about uh, your framework for synchronous versus asynchronous instruction. Mm -hmm. um, for example, someone, Philip, asks, what are your recommendations for classes with mixed beginner and intermediate students? And then Shelby asks, what are some examples of asynchronous discussions? Okay, um, so so Phil, one thing about the the mixed group um, with the synchronous and asynchronous, what you could possibly do is um, either have um, choices for the students to to answer. They can answer question one or question two or or something along those lines. One being a little bit simpler, or you can assign students to uh, specific questions, and then you can also create a different Padlet or a different um, Wakelet or or Nearpod for the the students who are a little bit higher level, and then you can push those out to the students so they don't see each other's necessarily, they just see their own, uh, which means a lot of cr more creation for you, but um, that's, you know, definitely something that you can do for the students. And when they come synchronously, um, you want to have a, a good mix of some more, you know, simplified language, simplified activities, and then some that are a little bit higher um, proficiency level, um, just to, you know, be able to have that balance. Uh, that is tricky, really, with it, the combination together. Um, but it is doable, again, through somewhat of an a, a asynchronous means, and then hopefully you'll be able to um, navigate that through that mix in the synchronous. Um, as for an asynchronous discussion, um, for example, let's say they're doing um, unit on biomes and, um, you know, you might ask a question about, um, you know, some, something to do with it or can you write what are the, the features of a, a biome for 
you know, rabbits or something. And, um, you know, the student would have to, or, or, you know, you can ask an opinion question more so um, for a discussion um, about uh, the biomes, what would happen if biomes of, you know, a certain species or whatever has been impacted by this virus, for example, um, or something more related to your content. And then the students would have to answer. And you can make rules such as, you know, you respond to the prompt and then you must respond to other classmates. And, and that's where you get that dialogue. And again, you want to show what is acceptable as a response to another student's work and uh, response on what is not acceptable. So if a student says, you know, um, this virus may impact the living uh, environment of, you know, certain animals and, and insects, and I'm worried about that, and how can we, you know, look to that in our larger talk about global warming, and then the, the student just says, I agree, you know, that's just not acceptable. So um, you want to model how best to, um, structure their their responses to both the prompt and to the other two students. Thank you. Thanks for that guidance. We're just going to have time for maybe one or two more questions before we wrap up. Okay. Um, Linda asks, do you have any suggestions or guidance for supporting content teachers in making adaptations and scaffolds for ELLs in an online environment? We do that all the time in face-to-face, -face, right? But what about right. in our mm -hmm. online learning? Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, oftentimes we as ESL teachers are, you know, helping the um, content teachers, but I do a lot of that in my coaching. Um, and again, something that I talked a lot to my content teachers about is if there is text, is there a way to provide audio? Um, because some L's may have their um, oral language skills further along than their literacy skills. And uh, that may not be available online, so you may have to actually record, um, you know, and there are lots of ways to record a, a file and then put that up onto your online classroom environment, um, particularly if it's an asynchronous presentation of that information. Um, also, you can go online um, with your synchronous lesson and read or, or present information uh, there that they have to read asynchronously. Mm -hmm. And then that you would reinforce that synchronously. So that content teachers um, in a virtual or cyber school do that all the time. Great. So. Now this is going to have to be our final question that I've seen come in from a couple of people. Uh, the most recent from Marianne, who asks for some direction for schools that have low incidence populations and or are in rural areas. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, so make sure, I mean, and this goes really for anybody, but you want to make sure that you're communicating with the, the families. Um, through whatever means possible, and you know your your population. So if it is something electronic that you can do through text or e email, um, again, you want to make sure that you are communicating as much as you can, or your school, you know, allows you to, as far as the schedule and um, you know classroom assignments, expectations, grades, uh, you know, all of those things that they're going to have anxiety about. So you want to really do that um, clear and concise and frequent communication, um, particularly with students who may be a little more rural, a little more distant. Um, and then if not, of course, through some means of um, through, through paper or through mail or what have you. Um, and um, for the students who, who you, if you have a low number of, of English learners, you may want to create a Zoom or, or Hangouts or something, Google Hangouts resource room that they can come and ask you questions about the, the assignments from the other classrooms, um, but you also need to de uh, deliver the ELD instruction. So, um, you know, you would again have a classroom where you would provide that in a virtual setting. And, um, and do the best that you all can because this is all so unwieldy and so, um, you know, ma happening all of a sudden, um, but deliver both that ELD instruction, that English language development instruction, and then also maybe serve as a resource room. Thanks so much, Jeannie. Um, so uh, here, we'd like to thank you so much. And would you like to see, uh, say a couple of words about um, you know, what, what you're doing <laughs> these days besides hosting webinars? 
Sure. Um, so I, again, I want to thank you, Diane, for having me come um, on and speak to your community. I mean, you know, this is just um, a surreal kind of uh, situation, but we're all doing our best. And, uh, and I want to thank your listeners uh, for their questions. And um, please keep them coming. If you have other questions of me, please contact me um, with, with any of those questions on today's webinar. Or if you'd like to know more about my other services, I have been an ESL consultant, as I mentioned, since 2002, working with K-12 and college institutions. Uh, my parent consulting company is Universal Culture and Language Services, in which I provide consultation and program design and delivery, as well as ESL tutoring. The College ESL is my newest venture, which grew out of the students' requests for our services to be more flexible in timing and location. So it's kind of ironic that I just built that this year. And... Um, you know, we are doing a lot more things online. So, but um, please contact me for any information at collegeesl1 at gmail.com. And I look forward to speaking with you and tackling this new frontier of ESL together. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks again, Jeannie. And please uh, keep sticking around. We're not, we're not done yet. Um, We'd like to share with you, you know, during these really crazy, uncertain times that, you know, we know it's difficult for you to make long-term plans for your school or district. Um, we're also happy to work with schools and districts to open up our five, 10-hour online courses that we usually run in the winter and summer. We can run those for you during school closures. I know a lot of teachers have expressed interest in doing some professional development now, now that they're suddenly found uh, home and sticking close to home. So if that might be of interest to you, get in touch with us at courses at getsupported.net. And we can, um, we can talk about a lot of different options. We can be super flexible. And our last poll, which I'm not sure how, uh, how nicely Zoom is going to be working with us right now, is if we're able to do a future live event, what time would work best for you to join? Oh, this one seems to be working and working quickly. So uh, indicate which time you would like to, you'd be the most available, especially z these next few weeks while your school might be closed. And we will collect those times and kind of go from here. We'll see if there's something that you might be interested in, let us know um, on the chat or send us an email. Um, and we're, we're happy to really pull our community together and provide services that might be most needed. So it looks like most of you are available more at 1 p.m. Eastern. So we will keep that in mind. Thank you. And um, last slide, whoops, is we want to thank you so much um, from Support Ed and for our, our Jeannie's wonderful expertise. We were able to pull this together very quickly. And we thank you so much for participating in our webinar. We will send you a recording of the webinar by email within 48 hours. Again, thank you so much for joining us and being with us here today. Again, we're all in this together. Please let us know what we can do to help and support you. And hopefully you found even more of a community today in our, in our very engaging chat. So thank you so much for joining. And this concludes our webinar. <laughs>